On Friday evening I had a constituency surgery and a woman about my age was complaining that uh, she had one relationship uh, fail because they couldn't see each other and she had a new boyfriend but he lives on the other side of the Welsh border and, uh, and, and therefore they weren't able to meet. Uh, this isn't something for government or the state uh, to be involved in. It's not even the physical act of the removal of the freedom, it's the demonisation of those people who want to argue in defence of freedom that has most concerned me in recent weeks. I said, so why are you ringing me? And he said, I need to check your thinking. So I just laughed and said, right, let me get this right. You're the police? And he said, yeah. Um, and you want to check my thinking? And he said, yeah. And I said, have you any idea what that makes you? And he said, no. And I said, well, there's a book called 1984 by George Orwell. Now, that's a dystopian novel. You're using it as a police operating manual. Britain doesn't feel very free at the moment, and that's bad news. For Britain, certainly, but also for the world. Because uniquely, British identity and our long history is rooted in the ideal of individual freedom. What does liberty mean to you, and, and why does it matter? I think the English, the British tradition of liberty, is something which we've all grown used to, perhaps we're too used to it and take it uh, too much for granted. But it has always been based on the assumption uh, that you're free to do something unless there is a law that tells you that you can't. Over the centuries, Britain has been known as not just a free country, but the free country. An island of liberty, a refuge from royal absolutism and from the totalitarian ambitions of fascists and communists alike. I spoke with former MEP and historian of British liberty, Dan Hannan, about how that happened. What made Britain so different? What, what happened here? We were beneficiaries of a lot of uh, happy accidents. Uh, one of the accidents was simply geography. If you're an island, you, you generally don't need a big land army to defend yourself. Uh, an island can be defended with a navy and a, a territorial militia, neither of which is a particularly good instrument for internal repression. So in England and then Britain, unlike in most of Europe, when kings wanted things, when they wanted money or, or, or taxes from their, their subjects, they had to ask nicely by summoning a parliament. They couldn't compel by force of law in a way that some of the more autocratic states could do. The other thing which I think is, is an underrated miracle in, in the English-speaking world is the wonder of the common law. This system that you know, grows like a coral with each case serving as the starting point for the next. I mean, nobody would invent it. If you're trying to come up with a, a legal system from first principles, you would say you write down the law, you make the general abstract principle, and then you apply it to a specific case. The idea that no one does that that it just kind of grows organically. I mean, who would invent that, right? Where did it come from? We don't really know, right? It predates written history. But it, again and again, in the story of the English-speaking peoples, it has turned out to be the real hero, the, the force that has held uh, autocratic government at bay and preserved personal freedom. In the 21st century, the idea of personal freedom has become so commonplace that we barely give it a second thought. It's hard for us now to appreciate just how radically different the ideas of individual liberty are to how most of humankind has always lived. We are unbelievably privileged to live in an age and in a place where we have some mechanisms to hold the government to account and some notion of the elevation of the individual above the collective. It's almost impossible to stress just how weird this is in the long sweep of things. You know, maybe 10,000 years ago, somebody worked out that if you put a seed in the ground, crops will grow, right? 
it took about five minutes for somebody else to work out that it was easier to nick your neighbor's crop than to spend all year tending to your own. And then comes the really pernicious discovery that if you want to maximize the utility to yourself, you regularize the theft, right? Mm. Through a series of tithes and tolls and taxes. So civilization was born in tyranny. And for most human beings, most of the last 10,000 years was the story of oppression and serfdom and caste and misery. And history was the story of the top 1% of the top 1%. The rest of us were, were scratching out a miserable existence, dawn to dusk, in the fields. And then comes this extraordinary breakthrough that happened more or less in the language that you and I are now talking. This idea that the rules are above the rulers that the people in charge don't just get to make up the law as they go along. That, that above the king or the biggest guy in the tribe, there is this invisible but ineluctable force of a, uh, you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't taste it, but it, it binds the king as surely as it binds his poorest subject. And that, that beginning of the rule of law, which leads to property rights, which leads to uh, some independent magistracy to enforce those property rights, which then leads to uh, the development of you know, intellectual property and the beginning of, of uh, uh, innovative free market society. That was uh, first the property of English-speaking peoples and, and a handful of people in the nearby parts of Northwestern Europe. But then in the 20th century, it began to spread around most of the world. And it has it has elevated and ennobled our species in a way that we just don't seem able to recognize. We must be the most uh, ungrateful generation ever to have lived. Britain's never been perfect, but the miracle was that what happened here happened at all. Here, ideas of individualism and personal freedom took hold early and never quite let go. And for all our imperfections, we exported our best values across the world, ending the slave trade, spreading common law and the parliamentary system. You talk about the, the English speaking peoples and you've written about the importance of the sort of the Anglosphere of, of the countries that sort of inherited this, this tradition out of, of Britain. Do you think that's still true today that there's this uh, relationship around the world? I think in general, the countries that are beneficiaries of the limited government, common law, private property based uh, tradition that began in the Anglosphere are other things being equal are going to be better off than the ones that are not. Right? So, so these, these values explain why Hong Kong is not China. You know, they explain why Singapore is not Indonesia. They explain why Bermuda is not Haiti. You know? And indeed, for that matter, they explain why, they explain why Israel is not Syria. We, we tend not to think of Israel as a former British colony, but it has the same property-based common law system and the same regulatory model as most of the, the core Anglosphere countries. So, you know, if you, uh, in, in, with a kind of Rawlsian veil of ignorance, if you didn't know where you were going to be born and you just had to make the choice, would I rather be born in a common law country, you would take it. But today, we find our oldest values under threat. For the best of reasons, the passing nightmare of COVID-19 has seen unprecedented curtailments of basic liberties. Do you think people in Britain today still, still care about liberty? It's a, it's a very good question. I think people do care about liberty when it's easy. But at times of threat, that's when you stress test it. You know, and that's what alarms me about the debates we're currently having uh, during these lockdowns. An epidemic or a war or an earthquake or a disaster of any kind flicks switches in our brains. It, it makes us more authoritarian, more collectivist, more intolerant, more tribal. It throws us back on our basic kind of hunter-gatherer heuristics. And just as the Second World War was then outlasted by a whole series of uh, government prohibitions that had been supposedly brought in contingently, but that then were not removed when the peace came. So I'm afraid that the same may happen as we come out of lockdown. So after 1945, the apparatus of state control that had been sold as part of mobilization, you know, in, in many cases remained in place for decades, arguably some of it even now. So we had, you know, we had rationing until 19... 
1954, we had ID cards until 1952, we had full conscription until 1960. But when you look at the economics of it, most of the controls put in, in place uh, in the first half of the 1940s weren't really removed until the Thatcher government in the 1980s. And, and in, in aspects of education and healthcare, we still have them. I'm afraid I can, I can see a similarly bleak future when I look at the world as it hauls itself out of the pupa of lockdown. It, it, we, we will also have been metamorphosed and not in a good way. You know, the, the, there will be a, a shift in power globally to more authoritarian countries, but the, the, much more alarmingly inside our heads there will be a, an authoritarian shift and you can see that already in the political debates in most countries. In other words, unless we reinvigorate our commitment to liberty, we will emerge less free as a country in small ways and large. Our Prime Minister Boris Johnson used to be firmly and publicly opposed to the nanny state. Now he wants the government to make us all lose weight. I'm not normally a believer in nannying or bossying type of, uh, of, of politics, but the reality is that uh, obesity is one of the real comorbidity factors. It's losing weight is frankly one of the ways that you can reduce your own risks. Claire Fox, a former Brexit Party MEP and now Lady Fox of Buxton, is also worried by what she sees. Boris Johnson, who's sort of somewhat libertarian, you know, traditionally in his, in his previous writings and so forth, but, but now not only is he pursuing these policies, which as you say, maybe in a temporary sense, uh, you can, one can understand, um, but he's talking about virtual ID card programs, he's talking about needing the state to make us all thinner. He, he seemed to have moved much further towards using state power in the long term yeah. uh, sort of the, to change things. Yeah. There has been a, a systematic I mean systematic attempt by the government, led by Boris Johnson, who called himself a libertarian, to argue against freedom in this period. And that is actually harrowing. And I think that, I don't think they've made a particularly consistent job of it, but what they've said is that there are other things that are more important than freedom. And each and every time they've said that, it chips away at that notion of freedom being a foundational value. And constantly we're told safety is the thing, you know, or, or health is, is the issue. And of course, once you establish that freedom is just this piddling little thing that we don't have to worry about, but the most important thing in life is, for example, longevity or health, then the consequences of that in the long term will be very far reaching. Meanwhile, we have witnessed the opportunistic eruption into our closed down public squares of a radical movement determined to paint our history as shameful and tear it down. What, what's worrying is not that you have a tiny handful of lunatics who think that it is somehow okay to attack the statue of Winston Churchill or Robert Peel or Abraham Lincoln. I mean, how absurd do you want to, you know, in the, in the US even attacking the statues of abolitionists and, you know, the, 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 every country has a lunatic fringe. You know, we, we don't get any special exemption there. The really alarming thing was the way in which official Britain humoured and indulged this lunatic fringe. The way in which politicians and police chiefs universities, corporations, premier footballers, drop to their knees, often literally, in order to appease this, uh, th these, these angry young blockheads. As things stand, we will emerge from the pandemic into a country not only far less free, but also stripped of the heritage and heroes that might remind us of our best values. And all of this is happening at the worst possible time as we exit the European Union, needing to assert our sovereign identity again, and as illiberal forces of all kinds gain power around the world. Now more than ever, we need to remember who we are as a free country and assert our British identity as a nation founded in liberty. There's an old response that everyone used to know when a busybody turned up and started trying to impose rules on the rest of us. It's a free country. In August 1647, Sir Thomas Fairfax was appointed Constable of the Tower of London, a public honour to reward the general who led the New Model Army 
to victory over royalist forces in the Civil War. When Sir Thomas made his first tour of inspection of this ancient fortress, he asked to see a great treasure that was kept there for safekeeping. Not a gold crown or royal jewels, but a crumbling roll of vellum. When Sir Thomas held this ancient document in his hands, he said that it was this, the Great Charter itself, Magna Carta, already then over 400 years old, and the ancient principles contained inside it, that his men had always been fighting to restore. Again and again, in the history of Britain and the English-speaking peoples, we see this special relationship to liberty. Instead of demanding that freedom be granted as a novelty, the cry has gone up that our ancient liberties have been taken away and need to be restored. Harry Miller, whose freedom of speech was challenged by the police for tweets over trans issues and took his case to the High Court, understands his very 21st century struggle in terms that Sir Thomas too would have understood. You ended up being, in Britain of all places, being visited at your place of work by the, the police who wanted to check on your thinking. How did that end up happening? It happened because I'd been posting on Twitter about proposed reforms to the Gender um, Recognition Act. Um, and obviously that criticised uh, the sort of ideology of, of, of trans, that people can change sex. So I'd not gone at anybody, I'd not attacked anybody, I'd not called for trans people to be um, attacked, harassed or anything whatsoever like that. So I was fairly certain that everything that I posted was, was absolutely spot on. But uh, one day in January 2019, uh, I got a phone call um, from PC Gull of Humberside Police. And he said that somebody from down south had um, complained to the police that they had 30 transphobic tweets published on my account, Harry the Owl. And uh, I said to the police officer, okie dokie, so are any of them criminal? And they said, oh no, none of them are criminal. I said, but this is absolutely, this is just absolutely crazy. Um, I'm not going to stop tweeting. I'm not going to stop expressing uh, a political opinion. Um, what you're saying is just utter nonsense. And I'm, I refuse point blank to comply. Uh, and then we, we talked some more. And this was a 34 minute conversation, 34 minutes. Uh, and we'd established that I'd not committed a crime by about minute one. Um, so I found, that, I found that very insidious, quite chilling, quite scary. I'm, a, I'm an Englishman, and um, Englishmen and women know that we are free under, under English common law to do precisely as we please and say precisely what we please up to the point that we hit a, a legal restriction. The statesman and philosopher Edmund Burke, himself writing a century after the Civil War and looking back to the glorious revolution of 1688, put it this way. In the famous statute of the Declaration of Right of the time of William and Mary, you will see that their care was to secure the religion, laws and liberties that had been long possessed and recently endangered. And what he meant by that was simple. Britain didn't need to modernise its way to liberty. Liberty is our heritage here. Freedom ebbs away when we forget who we are, when we turn away from our past. We're incredibly lucky to have inherited what we have, to have lived, to have been born in this country at this time, you know. And what we have inherited is an extraordinary, gorgeous, complex tapestry that is far beyond the ability of any one generation to have sown on its own. Right? And that does imply a commensurate obligation on us to improve it and repair it and then hand it on securely to those who come after. Right? Our children are not just a random set of individuals born to a different random set of individuals. If you are born in this country or if you grow up in this country, regardless of where your grandparents were born, you become heir to that tradition. You have your, your little share of that tapestry. And with it comes your share of the obligation to, to have a sort of repairing lease on it, right? To make sure that, that, that we maintain it intact and that we improve it where possible. Think of it like this. This 
used to belong to my great-grandfather. It was given to me by his daughter, my grandmother. It's nothing very special, but it's a little kit that he used to carry in World War I as some old matches and a uniform mending kit. Perhaps you have your own family heirlooms like this. Things that are passed down to you to be looked after and then given on, hopefully, to future generations. British liberty is like that, an inheritance of freedom. Obviously, we're, we're the inheritors, as you're suggesting there, of a very long liberal tradition in Britain and the United States. I mean, you know, back and forth as to how liberal as a country it was, but there was always a, a very long commitment to that value. And as the inheritors of that, you know, I think, do you think there's a, a responsibility there to sort of carry it forward and hang it, hand it on to the next generations in oh, some wow. sort of shape? There's a lot of disputes in recent um, months over whether, you know, history needs to be revised, dumped, uh, you know, how, you know, uh, only looked at through the most uh, malign uh, uh, um, lenses, you know, British colonial history, British brutality, and, and many of those things are, by the way, true. Uh, Britain has a lot of blood on its hands over the years, but it has other traditions as well, and I think that we have been rather complacent about bringing that history alive uh, for people. So I, w I, I would be in favour of that sense of history coming alive. And actually, you know, I found when I stood as a Brexit Party MEP, I always tried to, you know, quote some historical figure when I gave the speeches at Brexit Party rallies. Um, and people would often say, you know, they wouldn't necessarily have heard of, of, of um, you know, Tom Paine or the Levellers or, or the, you know, what happened in... in um, the historic sense of people fighting for freedom and it gave a sense of continuity a sense of a sense of a tradition as you rightly point out that's very important and we have never needed that tradition more than we do today we have to acknowledge that this is a great and freedom loving country and while the vast majority have complied with the rules there have been too many breaches too many opportunities for our invisible enemy to slip through undetected. COVID-19 has seen a shocking break in our traditional liberties. We are increasingly ruled by decree without parliamentary oversight. Worship, political protest, even dancing, drinking, singing and sex are prescribed or fenced with rules. Sir Graham Brady, chairman of the powerful 1922 committee of backbench Conservative MPs, felt compelled to speak out. In fact, you've said, if these kinds of measures were being taken in any totalitarian country around the world, we would be denouncing it as a form of evil. Why have you taken such a strong stance on this? Well, obviously there are a number of different concerns about the response to COVID, and a lot of people have talked about the balance between the economy and public health, and uh, the questions of uh, whether we're prioritising one age group over another and so on. That's been uh, well aired over the last uh, several months of the COVID response. What started to shock me uh, was that we were getting such a, a level of intrusion into uh, very personal aspects of people's lives with virtually no comment. But in many ways, the most shocking thing is the way that people are instructed as to whether they are allowed to meet their children or their elderly parents, uh, or whether they're allowed to uh, have friends over for a barbecue or whatever it might be. Whatever your view on the necessity of these restrictions, it is vital that we understand how much of a break they are from our liberal traditions. The COVID restrictions we've seen uh, brought into force in recent months turn all of that on its head and we move instead to a world of very detailed uh, restrictions where people are confused as to what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do, who they're allowed to meet, whether they can be with two people or six people or, or eight people, or if they're in Wales or Scotland they can see children as well as six adults. Uh, these are um, 
uh, I, I just think very, very worrying changes. And people do start to get used to different approaches if they're, if they're allowed to become ingrained, if they go without objection. I think the danger is that too many members of the public start to expect uh, government to tell them how to live their lives. When this terrible period is over, we must be ready to repeal the restrictions of our traditional liberties, not preserve a grim and joyless new normal. British liberty is a tradition to be cherished and preserved, one that has made the world better in countless ways, and more importantly, allowed ordinary Britons to live their lives as they chose. What does, what does liberty mean to you? Why, why is it so important to have these, these freedoms? Liberty, for me, it's what brings us progress. Liberty and progress and peace, I think, are all closely linked. If you're not free to think, then you're not free to speak. If you're not free to speak, you're not free to collude and congregate and share ideas and I think it's through the sharing of ideas and the challenging of ideas that we get progress and we get an increasingly civilised civilized world. Just as our system of common law relies on precedent, our idea of freedom looks back to ancient inherited liberties which it is our responsibility to preserve and pass on to future generations. Everyone keeps promising us a better future once the pandemic is over. But that's not the British way. We already have our inheritance of liberties. We just need them back. That's what Brexit was for. That's the firm foundation our United Kingdom needs for the challenges ahead. In 2020, we had to fight to have the national broadcaster play us patriotic songs at the last night of the proms. What were these controversial lyrics? Land of hope and glory, mother of the free. Britons never shall be slaves. That outrageous decision was overturned thanks to a grassroots campaign that the BBC couldn't ignore. And in the same way, up and down the country, groups are coming together to stop these destructive campaigns to tear down statues. And in many cases, they're succeeding. I'm very optimistic. I think if you're going to be an activist, you've got to be optimistic. I believe, I believe in change. I believe in the power of change. Just remember that you're dealing with a tiny unrepresentative. How did, how did Burke put it? You know, because uh, half a dozen crickets concealed beneath a fern make the field ring with their importunate chink while thousands of great British cattle chew the cud and are silent. Pray do not imagine that those who make all the noise are the only inhabitants of the field. It's a free country. The vast majority of us still want to keep it that way. If we stand up for our liberty, we are more than capable of winning the day for Britain's benefit and the good of freedom everywhere. It's not just a British tradition is the point I'm making. It's a Western tradition that's universal, that's open to everyone. Uh, freedom isn't an absolute, but it should be a presumption uh, and a very strong one.